Hi, this is Steve Hargudan, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Tuesday, 17th of October, 2012, and our special guest is Kirsten Olson, the author of Wounded by School, Recapturing the Joy in Learning and Standing Up to Old School Culture. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here. Yes, I'm really glad you're here, too. Thanks for sending me a copy of the book and coming on the show. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project, thanks to support from Mighty Bell, Blackboard Collaborate. And just as a reminder, I am on my Hack Your Education tour, which resumes a week from Friday in New York City. Uh, lots of fun. Uh, go to hackyoureducation.com. You're going to talk We've about that a little bit. Oh, good. I hope so. We've had a couple of uh, fun events. We had the Learning 2.0 conference in August as part of Connected Educator Month. Just a brilliant set of presenters and keynote speakers. That's all up at learning20.com. It is free, all of those recordings. We also finished this month uh, the two-day virtual Future of Libraries conference, Library 2.012, thanks to San Jose State University as the partner and co-sponsor of that event. Uh, those sessions are all up. If you're not, if you're not in the library world, uh, please look at some of those. You may become an ardent fan like I am of libraries and librarians. Um, many of you know the story. I actually inherited the Library 2.0 network when it was going to get shut down, but it had been the example network that I'd used for setting up Classroom 2.0. And I offered to take it over just to keep it going, and I'm now a huge fan. We have over 16,000 members in that network, and it is really valuable work. Wow. And then coming up, the Global Education Conference, the Mothership, November 12th to 17th. <laughs> Please do consider coming at 24 hours a day, five days, just a really, really fun event. You will not get any sleep. Be prepared. Coming up on the Future of Education next week, is it next week? Yeah, Susie Boss on her new book, Bringing Innovation to Schools, to School. Then uh, Denise Pope's coming on, Kirsten. Uh, she's been on the show before to talk about her Thank Challenge you. Success Program. Jamie McMillan, uh, I, um, probably most of you don't know Jamie, but she wrote a book on famous homeschoolers. And Cal Newport comes back on the show to talk about So Good They Can't Ignore You, why skills trump passion. So Cal's going to argue against our quest for passion. Should be very fun. He was a brilliant guest before on the show. Really glad to have him back. Yale Wishnick on dependency to success. Um, Tony Jackson and Veronica, I'm not going to know how to say her last name, uh, on educating for global competence out of the Asia Society. That should be lots of fun. Then the Global Education Conference. Uh, new to this list is Charles Hayes on a book I found from the 1980s called Self University. Really, really good book. I emailed him and asked him if he'd come on the show. He said, that book is so old to him, he's, he doesn't even like to open it and read from it. So he's going to talk about some of his newer work, but I haven't gotten it yet. Um, but I really, really like his message. And then Ray McNulty um, is going to come on to talk about his book, and he is at... Um, Penn Foster, and very interesting work on a large academic social network. Mm. If you've missed any of the shows, they are all recorded. Blake Bowles uh, came on to talk about Better Than College last week. Tom Vander Ark, I'm particularly proud of the Tom Vander Ark interview. Uh, you're probably going to know, those of you who've listened, that I disagree with a lot of what Tom says, and I think that I did a very good job of respecting his opinion, but pushing back. So I'll be interested to see what those of you who listen to it have said. Anyway, lots of interviews up there all in full Blackboard Collaborate form and MP3. So this is when those of you in our studio audience get to tell us where you're participating from. So look for the star to the left of the map. You'll click on it twice and click on the map and give us a shout out. I can see Bill's put his star up quickly. He's an old pro. Mm -hmm. Let us know in the chat. Oh, look, Australia, New Zealand. Beautiful. There's nothing like having international guests on the show. I have to tell you, participants, it, it makes me feel like we're doing something more than just talking to ourselves. The iPad doesn't let you have the star. Hmm, interesting. I also know that there's an issue with the web tour for iPads, as I recall. 
Look at that. Our our Asia Pacific region is hopping. Mm. What a lot of fun. So please feel yeah. free to continue putting your location in the chat. Those of you who are listening to the recording, we really appreciate that you take the time to do so. So Mighty Bell is this new project I am consulting on for Gina Bianchini. Many of you know that Gina started Ning and that I worked for Gina for 18 months using Ning. Gina has a, a, an incredible commitment to education. She's willing to pay me just to find ways to help educators do things for free. And we did create a Mighty Bell space for tonight's interview. It has links to Kirsten's websites and book, the articles about her and the like. So uh, please do feel free to, to jump in there at sort of curating content and conversation. Really a lot of fun. And if you're doing Twitter chats, I'm going to be really curious to see if you end up finding the Mighty Bell environment a little bit more productive for that because it actually keeps all of the content and, uh, and all of the messaging, which is becoming increasingly hard with Twitter. Mm. OK, Kristen, this is really fun for me. Um, I, you know, I won't beat around the bush think? here. <laughs> I, I loved this book. I loved the challenging that it did. I loved your approach. If I know you probably tell the story a lot, but I really would uh, uh, like to have you kind of describe the interview process you were going through and how it kind of surprised you what you were hearing. Can mm -hmm. I ask you to do that? Um, you mean the interview process for writing the book? Well, so as I read the story, you were interviewing those for whom learning was a part of their life and their happiness. And, yes. oh, and you yeah, were expecting yeah. to hear sort of these stories about their right. their learning that, that weren't that weren't actually the stories you heard. That's right. So I was in graduate school and in a very kind of um, fiery volcanic period of learning in my own life as an adult as a mom, as someone who was experiencing having four little people in school and trying to start a school. And um, I was really fascinated by the attributes and characteristics of people who were really, really powerful, fired up learners. What made them so? what kept them so lively as learners, and what had some of their seminal childhood experiences been around learning. And so I, I got um, some folks to support me in doing a whole project around that, which eventually became something I called virtuoso and artisan learners. And I did these really detailed, intense autobiographical interviews with these adults who were very successful people, um, research researchers at major universities, marketing executives, a novelist, an artist. And I, I talked to them about their early experiences of learning. And all of them said, um, without exception, my most powerful learning was never in school. And um, that was just so chilling and propulsive and resonant for me in terms of my own life experiences of kind of hiding what I was really passionately engaged in, a novel underneath the worksheets in elementary school or not being allowed to read ahead in um, something that we were reading in fifth grade because it wasn't allowed. And so I really had the sense that this was a story that needed to be told and that we didn't have good ways of describing what made people really have a tremendous amount of velocity around their learning and how they were able to escape the dulling and um, diminishing experiences of school. So that was kind of the origins of the project. I'm going to make a quick little announcement here to those of you who are in the chat. I'm seeing a fair amount of activity, and it can be hard to follow that. 
and I should have told you this earlier, in the default small chat window. So the best thing to do yeah. is to double click on the top and drag it out and expand it or look for the little menuing option there that lets you detach yeah. the panel. I'm sorry to interrupt, Kirsten. Um, yeah. uh, that was really moving to me in the book, and it, uh, I thought it was a yeah. great way for you to kind of introduce um, the rest of the material. I, I, it would be an, an exaggeration to say that I've read Deschooling Society. I've looked at every <laughs> word in the book, but I'm not sure I really understood it all, but um, Illich used the phrase school sick, and, right. and you've used it here too, and uh, yeah. I, you know, just the concept of institutionalizing value kind of knocked my socks off and left me thinking for days, but yeah. um, you describe the wounds that school leaves. Um, can I get right. you to explain those to us a little? So when I actually started writing this book, I um, I was out of graduate school now, and I was w actually working in schools, and I was really um, my eye was drawn to the students, and there were so many of them who were checked out and in the margins and silent in school, and I wanted to hear what was going on with them. And I wanted to understand what their experiences of being in the building and in this place, showing up every day, but not appearing to be very present was about. So I began to do the same kind of interviews with them that I had done with these um, virtuoso and artisan learners um, in graduate school. And this became this over 100 interviews for that underlie this book in which people from ages, I talked to people from ages 11 to 67, um, a huge range of people and in a huge range of present educational settings or past educational settings about what their learning experiences had been. And what I began to hear about was these patterns of wounding around their experiences, experiences as learners and their senses of themselves. And that I coded in a um, pretty conventional social science way. And that became these seven wounds, um, wounds of creativity, wounds of compliance, wounds of rebelliousness, wounds of considering feeling oneself to be average, wounds of numbness, um, wounds of underestimation and wounds of perfectionism. And um, each one of them had their own patterns and um, presentations, but the, the themes were, were really um, powerful and universal and led me to feel the ways in which this institution, I think, is really very toxic and wasteful for so, so many people who are currently in it or um, who have had very searing experiences with it in the past and the power of those experiences kind of incised into people, like talking to a man in his 60s who could remember his spelling scores in the second grade and thinking we just don't have a discourse for describing how powerful this institution is in people's lives and in their conceptions of themselves. And we really need to do that because we're not going to be able to fundamentally change this institution until we begin to talk about that. It was very interesting. You have four children. My wife and I have four children. Uh, I went through that list of wounds and actually could almost identify some element of each wound in our own children. Yeah, yeah. And when I do these uh, workshops, I keep changing the name of this workshop that I hold on Friday nights. It was originally called Your Child is Not Defective. Yeah, beautiful. But people told me that was, <laughs> I didn't get it. But it's really about kind of processing the school experience and then gaining, gaining yeah. some sense of ownership of learning, again, for families and individuals. And the first yeah. exercise we do is that we have people on post-it note write, post notes write down 
the things they remember most about their school or learning, and then they post them up on a timeline. And it's a it's sort of a tangible kind of physical activity. But intriguingly, many of the responses fall into these categories. Uh, you know, there are some that are quite positive, um, and and address sort of the other side of this. But there are a lot of a lot of wounds. Yeah. Having said that, you. Um, you surprised me in the book because I would have expected you to say school is toxic, start homeschooling. Mm -hmm. And yet really your message is, if I'm, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so correct me please, the message I heard was, here are the ways in which school wounds, be informed and yeah. help protect yourself, your children, your peers in the following ways. Um, I guess that um, the place that I am now is that um, for for many parents, for a whole variety of reasons, homeschooling, and Pat Ferenga and I are very good buddies, and um, uh, I think homeschooling is increasingly a very viable option for many, many folks. Um, but... For other individuals, it is not, um, and we are still reliant on the systems of education that are provided by the state in this country. And so I think that learning how to mediate um, one's sense of self in that institution and um, survive and also for my own children to be begin to have um, voice around social justice issues in the institution to be conscientious objectors to the things that did not work for them or individ other individuals um, was also an important part of the learning. Um, as I look back over, you know, our, our 22 years in public school systems. They are all now out of public school and in college. So it, when we began 22 years ago, the landscape was very different than it is now. And I'm not sure I would have made those same decisions for them, but I think that um, Understanding how to um, to be whole, to have compassion for the individuals who um, who are figures of authority in the system, but also to learn to stand up to them and object to what is wrong is is a really powerful set of learnings for kids and parents and others. I don't mean to put you in an awkward position, yeah. Um, but I'm interested in the candid sort of sense of uh, how do you think people are responding to this message? Is the book getting the visibility that you would have wanted? Um, do people kind of immediately get it, or do you find that there are sort of uh, barriers to understanding this? If I, you know, watching the debates, watching the conventions, and I'm increasingly interested that the larger narrative seems to roll on and gain strength, even with really good voices like yours talking about this. But are you experiencing something different? Well, I guess I am, and it may be that I'm hanging out with a particular group of folks, but my sense of this book since I, um, and you know, when I first began um, when it was first published, which to me feels like a while ago, um, a while ago in, in my own life, um, I spent about two years going around the country talking to groups of parents and educators and school leaders about the book. And my perceptions were that um, initially there was a kind of um, sense of um, real shock and that this was an embargoed and disallowed message, particularly coming from someone who had some um, robust establishment credentials. 
and had made choices to be in the system herself and um, with her own children and in terms of my own career choices. So um, so that was that was very powerful to me at the beginning. And then it has come to feel to me as if the message is um, much more familiar now and that many more folks are talking about the ways in which the system is dysfunctional and toxic and completely outmoded, in my view, and really in disarray in a whole variety of ways. That the talk about that is much more open. And for instance, Joel Klein, um, the former chancellor of the um, New York City public school system, you know, said uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, last month to a huge audience, no one says that K-12 education is working anymore. And I think that's a real change from 2009 to, um, you know, 2012. I think there's a, there is a real shift in the discourse in the sense that the, that um, the systems itself themselves are, are really, um, under siege and in some very significant transformation and it's not clear yet what the future looks like. And we are that, we are inventing that at this moment. That quote was particularly interesting to me because I hear two very different groups of people saying yeah. that. Yeah. And yeah. one group is the progressive liberal arts tradition, you know, kind of learning is important and the other group is we're not staying competitive we're losing jobs right. um, do you think he, that he had a, the full understanding that we would hope he does Joel yes Joel Joel I think that um, I think that he does um, Joel has been um, it speaks from his own his own biography and um, his his belief in what the future of education looks like, and I think he's he's is able to see both sides of that. I, I really hear you about these two different camps and their converging messages. Um, I I. I I guess I want to believe that he does have a relatively um, broad sense of of um, what he's saying, and that it's not just market solutions and privatization and choice that is the the future of education, the right future of education. He really names education as a public good and something that we are all as a society and a culture. Um, need to be interested in investing in. That's at least part of what I hear. So let's springboard from that because yeah. um, that message that, that education is more than job training, that, yeah. there's, that, that learning is about um, personal growth and pleasure and becoming more satisfied and being a, a valuable contributor to our society. It feels like that uh, that I did hear that message when I so I graduated from college in 1983. That was why I chose a liberal arts college. So I don't feel like that's necessarily a new message. But how did that get lost in in some way? And and how do we sort of describe what's happened to schools? Well, I guess that. It's, I mean, I guess what you're framing is a pretty big, a big problem. And the uh, one way to to begin that is that um, with the emergence of the No Child Left Behind era and um, the emergence of the the standards movement, um, which I would say began, you know, in the powerfully and in federal and state policy in the mid-90s and um, converged and gained momentum in the early 2000s, we began to, part of what fueled um, 
momentum for passage of No Child Left Behind was this definition of um, the purpose of education as being almost exclusively about what our economic um, competitive advantage was as individuals and as a culture and as a nation. And I think that that um, we really focused um, the, the whole discourse about the purposes of schooling into these incredibly narrow kinds of channels. And then the only ways in which we had to, to measure whether education was effective or not were these incredibly low level, um, gameable tests that um, had increasing economic and social consequences attached to them. And so I think that, you know, we're, we're really struggling like drunks out of that era. Um, race to the top is kind of, you know, um, the next iteration of that. But um, where we are going and what the national landscape looks like is something that I think we're all trying to give birth to. I mean, virtually every person that you've had on this program over the last several years is involved in that in that question. I mean, I don't know, does that does that? Yeah, it does. And it's interesting. As soon as I asked the question, I thought, well, but there's still this question of the industrial model of schooling. As as good as right. my family's vision of school was at the point in time at when I went that I went to college. We were also seeing the legacy of a system that was really designed to accomplish certain goals that, that right. now don't make sense. And is there one of the things that bothers me, I know you know ultimately it's a fair amount of optimism associated with the kinds of discussions we have. One of the things that bothers me is that legislation and governance are so tied into funds and lobbying right now that yeah. the, the absence of somebody who benefits by helping students become independent and self-directed means that we're not likely to see a narrative through the traditional governance system that will help to, to get us out of that factory compliance obedience yeah. model. Am I being too pessimistic? Well, I, I guess I don't know if, if I understand um, everything that you're saying. I'm sure that I don't. <laughs> but I guess what I think, what what I see is that um, education um, and learning experiences are increasingly becoming detached from this institution that we call school. I'm really unmoored from it and um, for individuals who have choice. And because there are really, as you know, at every moment, um, increasingly rich and powerful experiences of learning available everywhere. Um, and so I think that the institution of school as we have known it will become increasingly less significant and viable um, as, a, as an educational provider because it is so outmoded, except for those individuals who really don't have options. And that really, for me, is the critical piece, is, um, is what does the landscape um, begin to look like then? And um, who is left in this system? And what is our national commitment to a transformation of the landscape that holds the, the small d in democracy as um, a sacred piece of our, our identity and our um, commitment to children and young adults as a collective good? That's, that, that really, I don't know if that's sounding too lofty, but that really does bother me. Um, that that um, 
upper middle class kids can choose to not be in the system increasingly in ways that are really viable. And schools as credentialing mechanisms and accrediting mechanisms and knowledge controllers is really um, increasingly contested. So what is the what is the purpose of school and who and the systems of education that we have in place and who gets left in that system? And that for me is a really critical issue about how do we um, whom do, do the systems that we have currently privilege and how will the new invitations of technology further privilege those who are already privileged? That's a I think story. those are really, that's a really hard question. Yeah. One of the things that's come up in the interview show over the last couple of years is often the desire to categorize a better set of learning methodologies and yeah. to replace the current system with another system. Right. And I, you know, I love it that you brought democracy in here and in, and in your sort of the slide deck which we may or may not reference, you, know, you talk about sort of the meteor shower of the variety of ways in which this is being addressed. But one of the conclusions that I've come to is that the process is really important yeah. and like in democracy we understand the importance of participation as a fundamental part of governance. It seems to me that the, your meteor shower recognizes the importance of different solutions because they're involved at low, in, in very, in low at all levels with the participation. Yeah. Does that resonate with your own beliefs? It does. I mean, that the piece the the. What I increasingly see is this um, this w wonderful paradox, which is that as um, education untethers from school, and this thing that we have known as school for the last 150 years, um, there is this paradoxical equal need for sense of community and place that I think has um, has some geographical location. I think it's a both end. It's one doesn't obviate the other. And um, so I see, you know, as I go out around the country and, and work in schools that I think are, um, you know, as we call them an idea, pockets of brilliance or with um, community communities that are putting together educational um, centers and, and um, collectives that seem to make sense for members of that community, they have this very homegrown quality to them. And they are really about the individuals and the values of this particular community while they take advantage of these hugely boundary expanding possibilities of our new networked um, learning world. So it's a so I I love that paradox of as we go ever outward, we also have this increasing need for community and place and um, a, uh, a tribe where we are known and challenged and asked to show up in in ways that are important. It would be a substantial irony given the, the, what you've described here, if we looked at one particular solution and then tried to mandate that or overlay it on another community. Yeah. So what I hear you say when you use the word community is I do hear participation. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, the schools, and it's hard for me now increasingly to know whether to even use the word school because to me, it, it has this still this 19th century valence to it that I think is going to increasingly feel wrong to us. Um, but these these um, educational places um, that seem really full of vitality and meaning and um, emotional resonance 
as I go around the country, are really grown up out of communities and people who care tremendously about the communities that they're in. They're an expression of community values and um, a community-based vision of what it's important for kids to know and how adults and young folks need to interact with each other. So, so I do see the, the, these kinds of evolving systems as growing up out of a very rooted sense of place. Again, taking advantage of this incredible boundary expansion. I mean, we've had we've had this incredible boundary expansion um, and a total transformation in the systems of learning. At the same time, our understandings of how the human brain learns. Um, Simultaneously, I mean, two, two really um, uh, system-smashing events over the last two decades, and so I think it is no surprise that the that the the systems that we have are are really floundering, and um, I would say. It's not clear what their what their moral or social purpose is. I love it that Jenny in the chat mentioned libraries, which Jenny <laughs> does make the connection. I, that's what I keep seeing in the vision of learning that librarians and I need to go to the have. chat. You know, I haven't got it up. So it's I can really see hard it, to follow. So. It will distract you. Yeah. Um, and well, it, the chat is usually the most fun. So I'm sorry that I'm. <laughs> You can save it afterwards and read it. If you go up to those of you who want to do the same, you can go up to File, Save, and you can save the chat afterwards. And of course, in the recording, it's fully available. Okay, I don't. I want to make sure we we spend some time on these chapters, the healing chapters. Um, yeah, nice. the, the, these were just magic for me. I mean, the, the, I've doubled the size of my book from dog earring pages. The Parents who heal chapter is the most detailed. Now, I think that has something to do with the fact that you have four children. But it, uh, one of my worries about that chapter, aside from the brilliance of it, is that you presume, and please push back, it seems to me you presume an ability on the adult's part to see education from a metacognitive level that I often mm -hmm. think is actually at the heart of the, it, that its absence, the absence of mm. parents being able to do that is often at the heart of the problem. Mm. So say more. I agree with you. I mean, I think, I think you're right um, that the uh, um, encouraging um, students to be anthropologists of the system and to notice and observe its effects and purposes, um, to have a, a metacognitive um, capacity to, to observe what's going on for them and their own learning is, um, it may not be may not be a skill that we talk about or have tried to develop enough. Again, you know, maybe this is where a place where the discourse really needs to be much more powerful. We need to spend more time talking about this. I loved your suggestions for parents. I loved them. I mean, um, the sort of the way you would talk to your child about school, the, the, you know, just the idea that you would support the child in being an anthropologist, the change agent, or conscientious of objector. But I can tell you that when I have this conversation with other adults, it's the adults who very quickly shift into, but this is what's needed to get into college, or this is what they have to do, or um, it's rare for me to find another adult who talks at the level that you describe in the book, as much as I loved it. So is there, how might we help that particular conversation? Hmm. I wish we could go to, I wish I could see the chat here because I think that they would, what is the chat saying about this? 
Um, Let's see. Talking with talking with kids about school takes skill building time. Okay, that's actually a good lead in because when I had this conversation with um, Tom Vander Ark, he had this yeah. sort of kind of glowing picture that he portrayed <laughs> of online learning saving all of this time. And I said, right. Tom, as a parent, I can tell you helping my child become self directed easily takes three to four times the amount of time that it is just to follow the rules. I don't see this being a time saver. I actually think this is much harder. It's much more satisfying. It's much more fulfilling to me as a parent. But giving my children agency is significantly harder. I love the, uh, the Robert Freed quote about his own kids and, and the the you know the difficulty in letting go, it's really yeah. hard. Yeah. So I I think that part of the issue for me is that for parents it's also a lot easier to just follow the system, and and to tell their kids just follow the system. I guess so. Then um, when we see um, the kinds of terrible impacts that school can have on kids. And the ways in which it makes it can make them small, and I mean this even for kids who seem to be um, the most glowing and shining examples of achievement um, in our system, who are still incredibly truncated and um, and diminished by this system that values them in terms of what what they can accomplish and, um, uh, you know, what their competitive advantage is, I think that m most parents do have um, a compassionate appreciation for that and often feel um, really torn about it. They feel that they have to, they have to get their kid to achieve because um, that's sort of an, a necessary component to becoming an adult. And the system seems overwhelming in terms of how, how, do, you, how do you protect your child um, um, from internalizing some of the messages that they're getting from school. Um, is it possible for a child to be quote unquote successful and also have this um, capacity to notice that the system has some um, larger intentions um, and designs for all of us that may not be in our self-interest or in the best interests of the community. I think it is. I think that we underestimate people's capacity to hold those that that complexity of understanding. I see kids and talk to kids all the time who are doing exactly that. And um, I think that the, the um, decreasing power of school as the only conventional school is the only game in town is going to empower parents and kids and other folks more and more to be in exactly that kind of um, dialogue about do we really need to be here? What is the moral purpose of this institution? What is it actually doing for us? How could it be better? How is it actually um, difficult for the individuals who are trying to administrate it and teach in it? Maybe that's the model. Maybe the model of your interviewing those successful individuals, which is a form yeah. of appreciative inquiry in many ways, maybe yeah. that's the model of, uh, there, was a, there was a note in the chat here, we need to train the parents a lot. <laughs> the irony of that was not lost on me. But maybe that's the, the approach, which is to place people in a position to describe their own education and their own circumstances. Yeah. 
circumstances and yeah. then to draw conclusions from that. I, again, I've taken us a little uh, bit down a rabbit hole here and didn't mean to, so, to dive so deeply, but it is a you know, great curiosity to me. It is. One of the things that I do when I'm talking to groups of people about this, and I feel like we're getting into very um, high, you know, sort of um, 30,000 feet territory, is just to ask people to begin by asking them to write about their most powerful learning experience, to, to remember one, and to try to talk about why it was so powerful to them, and to connect them, to try and reconnect them to um, the pleasure of that. And for, again, not surprisingly, for many, many audience members, um, these were not experiences in school. And then kind of what are the losses of that in our lives if we don't have everyday pleasure in learning? And um, how could we get that more? And how could we inject more of that, make that more of a priority in how we are interacting with our kids, how we're thinking about our own lives? Um, I mean, the tremendous pleasure and joy of learning, I think, is something that, you know, we just, we just can't talk about that enough. Um, that that alone is kind of a divine inspiration. Um, so profoundly um, joy giving and um, life enhancing that in some ways, you know, we've got this crazy system that says learning is really terribly difficult and hard and we have to force human beings to do it and shame and punish them if they don't. And in some ways that's, you know, this kind of paradoxical flipping of um, human evolution. There's so much good conversation in the chat, but I want to move on and uh, no clue. I'm just blown away by your comment. There are others here as well, um, but we'll have to just come back to that in a future show. So, Kirsten, you talk about also teachers who heal, and yeah. I've told this story yeah. this year many times of a teacher last year for our daughter who was in eighth grade last year, who just sort of brilliantly lit her up. You know, yeah. he was a yeah. whole person. Yeah. The kids loved mm -hmm. him. He was an English teacher. Yeah. They knew everything about him. They knew about his dog, his wife, his baby. Um, there's something so powerful about life modeling that often yeah. gets lost in these conversations. And I see it yeah. particularly for the parents and for the teachers. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the Teachers Who Heal section yeah. and some of the things yeah, that you feel most important? I do. Because this, um, it's important to say, I think, that... Um, you know, in my own work, what I am increasingly drawn to is um, is not to analyzing the dysfunctions of this institution, but to talk about kind of what the working with um, individuals and teams and groups of people who are really interested in trying to do transformational work about um, the future and about healing and um, one of the things that I began to hear really strongly in these early interviews was the power of a single individual, and it was sometimes a teacher, to really transform a child's life. Um, and as someone said very memorably, um, and this was sometimes a coach, um, it, it sometimes was a peer, um, in one case, it was um, a minister, but um, this, the person said that the, a really critical turn for them in their learning life was um, meeting this individual who saw so much more in them than they could see in themselves, and um, they were like an imaginal bridge to my future. And I think that that is, you know, in a in a really... Um, gifted, um, impassioned, grounded teacher. 
um, they have that capacity to see the future um, eminent in a kid and light them up. And that often was the turning point in a very wounded learner's life in my, um, in my research and now experientially everywhere, is this experience of someone believing in us deeply, seeing things in us that we don't see ourselves, and sort of stubbornly bearing witness to it and saying, yeah, I'm going to ask you to step up. You are awesome. And, and I'm just going to ask you to do more than you think is possible. And people experiencing themselves and their own capacities in ways that they never um, had before. I loved this section. We're not going to have time to go into it, but if you haven't read the book yet, uh, look for the Skateboarder Club story and the section on Flickr, which I think both were brilliant. How do you create this kind of an environment as administrators or as teachers who have a say in their school? Are you seeing strategies that work well for creating the space for teachers to build these kind of relationships? Yeah, I think that um, I do see um, strategies for it. I think that there, if the adults in the building are encouraged to see themselves and their own possibilities um, powerfully um, in the adult community, and the adults themselves regard their adult community as a learning um, collective where um, people are really engaged in talking about things that are powerful and important to them as adults, then I find that this trickles down into the student community in very, very powerful ways. So the first thing that I do when I go into a school is really look at how do the adults regard each other and hold each other in community as learners. And are they excited about each other and what each one of them is learning about? Because if that's going on, then kids are almost always going to be also involved in really powerful um, experiential exploratory learning. So I think that adults really set the community with each other. And they need to be reinforced in that. I mean, oftentimes in the school, you can be in a very um, deadening environment and then go into a single teacher's classroom that is this world of liveliness and possibility. And you talk to that teacher and they feel incredibly isolated and alone and survive by closing the door of their classroom and creating their own self-sustaining world in there. And we need to have whole schools and educational places that are devoted to that experience of adults being engaged in powerful learning together um, so that that redounds to the student community. And we haven't looked at the work in that way. We don't have not defined the work in that way. There are a number of stories in the book that bring tears. This is, they're just powerful stories. One of the ones that that, re that I really remember from the book was the girl who was in the one class where the teacher was just head down kind of reading material and her just sort of despair and then going into another room with a teacher who shook hands with her and said, I, you know, I will not talk to you for more than 10 minutes and we're going to have guests and it was a, it was a really great sort of dramatic showcase of how significantly different a classroom could be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so students who heal. Those of you who are yeah. familiar with the show will know that I often promise a Q&A session and then don't get to it <laughs> because there's too much good to talk about. You're just going to have to forgive me. If this is a weakness of mine. But I don't want to miss the students who heal. And I, yeah. I'm going to ask you for permission. I would like to copy this and do this as part of my workshops, the student yeah. consciousness raising groups. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, at some 
schools um, in which I work, we have um, formed groups of really modeled on an old-fashioned women's liberation consciousness raising group where you get a group of um, middle schoolers, um, although I think this can be done with elementary school um, schoolers as well, or middle school and high school kids together, and they begin to talk about their experiences of being a student in school and what is working for them and what isn't and why it isn't and how it might be different. And um, really um, prompting folks to begin to um, have that meta-analysis that we were talking about at the beginning of the, the session of what is, why does school make me feel this way? Um, why does it privilege certain individuals in the ways that it does? Do we think that's right? How else might it be? Um, what is our, what is, what does being smart mean to us? And what are the definitions of um, that in this building? And do we think that they're um, they're the they're the ones that matter to us? Are they too narrow? Questions like that that begin to um, get kids into a place where they are analyzing their experiences of school rather than identifying them personally as their own only and um, getting a broader sense of the emotional and intellectual experiences of um, people across grades and um, developmentally in different places that I think can be very empowering for kids. And so then usually there's um, kids move to, to trying to do some kind of action around changing something about the school and then beginning to experience what, what that is like, but really beginning to name the values that are instantiated in school, which oftentimes are invisible because they're so familiar. So again, like what, how do we, who, what's the system of privilege here in this school? How do we f define what success is? Um, who decides what matters? and how status is assigned, do we agree with those things? Do they cohere with our values? I've been in really interesting conversations with second and third graders about those things. Do you call them consciousness raising groups? Is there a phrase you use that that is attractive we, to students to come? We usually um, uh, have called them, let's talk about school talks. Um, Let's talk about the values of school. And um, sometimes this is in relation to a particular reading. Like um, in a high school group that I was in, um, a part of recently, we began with um, Peggy McIntosh's Unpacking um, White Privilege. And that, as a piece of what does that look like in this in the institution of school, and that led to a whole, a whole um, another set of discussions about um, what is status about here, um, what is the purpose of the institution in terms of how it sorts and tracks people, why might it do that, what could we do about that? That's just brilliant. I'm going to email you separately and make sure you're okay with me copying some elements of that, but I love it. Yeah. One of the um, things we try and do on the show as a courtesy to the guests and the participants is to end on time. So uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'm clapping. Thank you for having me here. It's so hard to find that darn applause icon, but it's under the smiley face, go down to applause. Uh, Kirsten Olson on Wounded by School. Really so delightful to have you on the show. Thanks for taking the time. I know you're traveling, right? 
I am traveling, and um, we're having, yes, and we're having an idea event here um, in Boston tomorrow. So so we're, we're all at this. IDEA is the Democratic Education Group, right? That's correct. And that's right. Mal we're trying to... That's another discussion. Well, Malia's been on the show, and so has Scott. Scott Nunn, so, so we've, yeah. Uh, we've had good discussions there. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Don't miss Susie Boss, Denise Pope, and Jamie McMillan next week. Uh, really delightful, Kirsten, to get to know you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great, great day or night, depending on where you are. Really appreciate your being here. Take care now and bye. <laughs>